order to motivate the group, Jersey pretends he's a total moron and comes up with some idiotic plan involving silly things. I go in as a pizza delivery guy. What? Hey, Navy guys love pizza. Jersey extends this to describing a sexual fantasy about Jan. If Jan was in a slinky red dress, the guy at the gate won't even care if we're on some list or not. Jersey. She could have a gun strapped to her garter belt and, and a clip of ammo between her. Or maybe somebody else has a better idea? Jersey's being disrespectful to Jan here, but he eventually stops, presumably at Jan's glare. Though Jan is physically strong and can really hurt him, I imagine he stops from recognizing that he's crossing the line rather than actual fear. He also explicitly wants to annoy Jan to motivate her into making a real plan, as he explains to Kamal a moment later. He just had to break the ice. Girls like Jan and Durga? They feel better if they're bailing out some hapless guy. So the story is exploring sexism and its characters, but I don't think that the story itself is sexist here. They end up sneaking into Chala base dressed as soldiers. Because Durga can't access the base's network from outside, Kamal briefly pokes a hole in the firewall so she can download a copy of herself into the Chala network. They then make their way inside Building 41, a heavily secured facility with only one way in or out. Ronnie uses her analytical skills and a Standish impression to intimidate the guard into allowing her to evacuate the building for a secure sweep and Durga locks the door behind them. However, the lab where the artifact is kept is in an isolated portion of the lab and the techs inside didn't hear Ronnie's call. Because the room is filled with argon, the techs have to wear vacuum suits. So they figure that one of them could put on the vacuum suit and deactivate the artifact without being discovered. Jersey is the only one with experience in wearing a vacuum suit, so Jersey goes in to turn it off. Jersey. Yeah. Maybe you are the hero type. The implication of this is that Jan forgives Jersey for spying on her and now sees him as a love interest, which is a bit problematic. I can see it happening given that they're going through this stressful situation together though, and Jersey himself is basically harmless to her. It's not like in Twilight, where Edward admits to sneaking through Bella's window and watching her while she sleeps, and her response is embarrassment about how stupid she must have looked. In contrast, Jan reacts with hostility to learning about the spying itself, and only forgives him through working together and performing serious, extremely tense activities. Anyway, Ronnie comes up with the idea that Jersey has to use the controls on the artifact in the reverse sequence. Jersey goes in to activate the device while Ronnie distracts security at the door trying to come in. The lab techs realize Jersey doesn't belong there and draw their weapons. Jan goes to rescue him, holding her breath and using her ninja skills to take out the techs, but one shoots her in the chest. She manages to take them all out and then runs out to have Kamal patch her up. Jersey activates the artifact, sending out a gigantic EMP that shuts down the countdown as well as pulls the Melissa fragment in 2004 back to the future. The Seeker and the Spider are left behind, but the Spider is quick to kill it and then hunkers down to wait 548 years. Meanwhile, the collision of the Melissa fragments causes the AI to freak out. Module Core Hemorrhage 40 is being classified and has a strong intrusive inclination. Warning, network throttling has been broken. What the hell is that? Durga? Is that you? And the medium has metastasized. Melissa is, at this point, essentially the operator with the sleeping princess as a separate personality without any of the last two months of their development. Security breaks in, but Ronnie keeps them from going any farther by saying terrorists have mined the place. Kamal recognizes that Yasmin's personality has come out, so he wants them to transfer this Durga copy outside to merge with the existing Durga. Jersey and Jan want to just leave, so Kamal threatens to shoot them if they don't. This is another case of the typical masculine aggressiveness being displayed, here for the noble goal of protecting his sister. Jan agrees, but says that she could still totally take him if she were pressed. She's not really being coerced here so much as appreciating Kamal's desire to be with his sister. Jan has this typically masculine fighting ability, subverting stereotype as you would think Kamal would have ability to threaten the girl. Jersey talks to Melissa and brings out the Durga personality, helping her to get control. Meanwhile, security thinks Ronnie is a traitor because of the EMP and lack of mines, so they arrest her. Durga hacks into various parts of the base to cause a huge diversion and then uses a remotely controlled scorpion to blast a hole in the wall to let Jan, Jersey, and Kamal escape the building. Scorpions rock! When I get drafted, I want tank duty. They all make it out okay, and Durga sets up Standish to make it look like he was responsible for the whole thing. The Halo graphic novel notes that he is eventually executed for killing Herzog. Over the next week, Melissa gets her identity issue sorted out and emerges like a sane Durga who can slip into her Yasmin persona at will. From the outside, she affects things to help free Ronnie, 
first by having her transferred to civilian jail. She sends Sarah John to visit her. When the AI starts talking from her chatter, Sarah John reacts with alarm. What the hell? Durga? Is that you? Now new and improved. Ronnie, you're getting spooky again. Durga is a gigantically powerful ex-military rogue AI. Coming through your chatter. My chatter? Little bottle, big genie. I'm the one that got Ronnie into this mess. No, I got myself in this mess. Well, you sure as hell better be getting her out. Sarah John, unless you want your name changed to Trixie D. Light on every government form for the rest of your life, I advise you to hush up and be polite. Here, the threat is of giving her a name like that of a porn star. It plays upon cultural attitudes regarding pornography and female sexuality. Western civilization is formed around Christianity and its values. In the Christian belief system, sex is only considered moral when conducted for use of procreation within marriage. Sex for pleasure or outside of marriage is considered sinful. Women involved in prostitution are considered of extremely low value. The Christian allegorical figure, the Whore of Babylon, is an evil figure with control over men because she's the embodiment of prostitution, and she represents some sort of evil empire with control over the world. The culture of prostitution and pornography came from a strong patriarchy, and the modern sex industry is predominantly shaped by men wanting some escapism from a world in which they feel restricted by having to treat women with respect. Even though prostitution is largely shaped by male sexual desires, women are blamed for being evil seductresses. Women today are encouraged to be nothing like the lower women in prostitution, and any sign of enjoying sex is to be shamed with a comparison to a whore, such as with the word slut. Though I think the porn industry definitely deserves to be criticized for showing degrading depictions of women, this is not the context used in I Love Bees. Good higher class women want to stay well away from those awful lower class women, and this is the context in which Ronnie is able to threaten Sarah John, even jokingly. It's a classist, sexist joke. Well, Durga pretends to be a human lawyer and gets her out of jail. She then has everyone meet in Jersey's apartment so she can explain the little plot points that were hard to understand. Thanks to Halo 2 being about to begin, she can make the connection between the artifact and Halo. So we did save the world! Whoa, yeah! <laughs> 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 Doesn't get much better than that. No. Yeah, you know, only way it could be better is if we'd use my plan. Ah, uh, your plan? Why your plan? Because we would have saved the world and had Jan in a slinky red dress with a gun in her garter belt. Ugh, whatever. Okay, that's a good point. Uh-oh, Jan's got that look in her eye. Like if she had the gun right now, I'd be history. Oh, Jersey. If I had the garter belt, I wouldn't need a gun. <sighs> this is a use of sexist humor performed in such a way that it is not to be taken as offensive because Jan retaliates with some threat of violence. Similar to the common anime trope where a man does something offensive and the woman responds with fantasy violence. Even though the woman supposedly gets comeuppance, it really just functions as a way for sexist humor to enter the plot without being sufficiently criticized. It often allows sexist humor to be repeated because there isn't a clear message against it and is therefore problematic. Durga slips into her Yasmin persona and allows Kamal to speak with his sister. It was like the Snow Queen took me, Kamal. And then you came and rescued me. You did. You and Jan and Jersey and Ronnie, my secret friends that unlocked Harzog's voice inside my head. So I knew what I had to do. You all rescued me and I'm so grateful. Only some years had passed and I, I, I changed. Yes, me, you're still there. No, she's not, Kamal. The clockwork rat got her. Clockwork rat? She grew up, Kamal. She's Durga now. Durga the AI is now characterized as the adult form of Yasmin the human. While they were introduced as separate entities, they are now more or less the same person. Kamal refers to himself as a machine too, just an organic one. Durga has achieved legitimacy as a real person in a weird transhuman way. This is described in the farewell letter to the players of I Love Bees, in which Melissa says, It's been the last, best kind of quality experience. You made the girl real. 
Now, the whole line about a quality experience and a girl being real is a good piece of writing in that its throwbacks feel powerful, but its usage here is a bit sexist. It's made clear that Durga is to be considered an adult woman, and describing her as a girl plays into the general infantilization of women in society. Kamal arrives back at home to find both his parents alive and Sophia there claiming to be his fiance. Aiden's papers for his parents cleared and they left for Earth before Coral fell. Posing as a lawyer, Durga freed Sophia and made her an official citizen. Kamal takes Sophia aside and asks her why she wants to marry him when she doesn't need a green card. She gets angry at him for presuming her interest in marrying him wouldn't be romantic, leading to this. Sophia, shut up for just one second. Did you just tell me to shut up? Yes. Will you marry me? Marry man who proposes by telling me to shut, shut up. Marry me? <laughs> yes. Since Sophia initiated the marriage plans, her acceptance of marriage is a foregone conclusion. What is demonstrated here is the idea that only the man can officially propose. It doesn't matter that they're in love and both want to get married. Sophia cannot initiate and Kamal simply agree. He has to ask her semi-formally. Durga also freed Aiden and he comes over to borrow some money. Kamal gives him a chip to say thanks. I never owned Soph. You thought I did, but like I said, you aren't a great judge of character. I can see his wording as relating to his status as a successful gangster, rather than this just being guy talk. Either way, though, it's condescending. Kamal gathers his family and prepares to introduce Durga. Mama? Oh. 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 oh my god. What is that? Oh god. I've gotta get home. It's a Covenant capital ship. Those little sparkles of light are Seraph fighters. They're here. An Oni agent from Section Zero, Internal Affairs, contacts Ronnie on the train to recruit her as a spy. She anticipated this and agrees. I want a black suit and knockout gas. If I'm going to be spying on the spies, I definitely need a pen full of knockout gas. <laughs> you certainly do. I'll see what we can do about it. They're here. Kevin Morales, another Spartan 1.1, recruits Jan for a vigilante faction to go and fight the Covenant. He was reluctant to contact her because he feared she'd have psychological issues as a result of being raised by James and Gilly, but he found out about Durga and now finds her too valuable to ignore. Jan goes home to talk to Gladys about it. Hey Gladys, Gilly, what you up to? Cooking! Cleaning. Mm. A domestic. Here we have another example of Gilly's masculine characteristic of being a fighter, being used in a traditionally feminine manner, like her earlier description of grenades as fashion accessories. This is used for humor because it's entirely inappropriate for these two to be together. Are you going? I think I have to. Jan, your father's gone. Just who are you trying to save? Whoever's left. That's it, they're here. Durga tries to protect Jersey from the truth by blasting jazz music, but he yells at her to turn it down. What's with the music, Durga? Jersey, there was this virus. Yeah? Can you turn down the music? And what it really wanted to do was find that artifact or artifacts like it. Uh-huh. And then, you know, it wanted to send a signal. The virus would try anyway it could, Jersey. That was its mission, to reveal the location of the artifact. It was designed to bring the covenant to wherever it was, Jersey. Before they were too far away, but now... Turn down the freaking music, Durga! I can barely hear you! Enjoy it, Jersey. Take a minute. Just leave it What are you... Durga! Jersey, don't... Would you just turn down... Oh. oh. Yeah. You sent my mom to the vault. Yeah. You sent Sarah John to the bunker. Yeah. Taking care of family. Yeah. Durga... They're here. And that's the end. The end. The end. I have some issues with the story as I have described, but I am otherwise very happy with I Love Bees. I love I Love Bees. I Love Bees contains a number of female characters, many of whom are powerful in some way. The characterization is strong across the board so that they are neither too weak nor too strong. This is probably because the design team at 42 Entertainment was headed by women such as Susan Bonds and Jane McGonagall. The character I have the most problems with is Sophia, but even then she's got a strong backstory about living off the grid and rising up from poverty. As for male characters, they're 
they're pretty decent. So it's not like the female characters are developed to the exclusion of male characters either. Or are women exclusively good? Monster Anne is a woman worse than thin. So yeah, there are definitely problems with Isle of Bees, but it's a very feminist work in general, and I love it. I love I Love Bees. I love it. I Love Bees was originally just a fun but non-canon side story, but Bungie decided to embrace it as canon, with references to the Oni plot in the Halo graphic novel. Finally, 343i now claims it as canon. It's, it's canonical and it's set in a connected part of the Halo universe. <laughs>